Now, I was told to be brief with my introduction of Dr. LeMaitre this morning, but I will tell you right now that is just impossible. So I'm not even going to try. What I will do instead is to provide a what I think of as a secular Thanksgiving um, note for us today, given the holiday that's about to come upon us next week. So first of all, I would like to thank my staff, Cherie, um, Cherie McClellan and Jessica Lingerfeld, who helped make this seminar series the success that it is. So on your way out or next time when you come back on the 14th, please say hi to Cherie and thank her for the work that she does with us. Uh, next, I'd like to thank our uh, trainees and our students at the institution. They are our future for, the, for cancer prevention and cancer research and the application of these in the population to reduce the burden of cancer on our public health. I want to thank our faculty because they are our teachers and the scientists who lead the discoveries that we have going in place right now. I want to also thank them because they serve as our mentors, our role models, and our advocates. This is important for us because without them, we don't know which way to go. We, we navigate blindly between Scylla and Charybdis, the Greek mythological monsters, and uh, if any of you have ever had to survive an NIH submission, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I want to thank our institution and all the people who contribute to that. I mean, this is a wonderful institution, and if you've ever worked anywhere else, and I just came back from the government a year and a half ago, you know what a valuable place this is. Every day when you wake up and you come to work and you see all these people working so hard from the people who make those magical restrooms function and be clean for us, to all the people who are welcoming our patients and all the, the scientists and the physicians who are here taking care of all the patients. Um, I want to thank our patients and their families for their struggle and their, their inspiration for us because without them, it would be hard to get up in the morning because cancer is so difficult to deal with and we'd like to prevent it. And so we wake up and we think about their struggles and how we can reduce that for them. And finally, and to trying to be brief, I want to thank Dr. LeMaitre because back in 1964, actually leading up to 1964, he and his colleagues set the tone. They changed the face of history with this 1964 report to the Surgeon General. And so I want to thank him especially for making everything that we do possible. Thank you. And I think there's one more thank you we ought to give, and that is Dr. Sean Chang, who works very hard. Thank you. I think it's of some importance to set the stage for this uh, talk by telling you that the public health service at the time this was done is not the public health service you know today. The public health service at the time of the 1964 report had quite a different stature in that it was much greater in the sense that it had a commissioned corps that had been a part of the military through World War II and the Korean War. And it had served such marvelous work throughout that war, one of which was the beginning of biologic warfare defense. Uh, which began with the Epidemic Intelligence Service over in Atlanta. And the National Institutes of Health and the NCI, all of those institutes reported through the Public Health Service at that time. Whether as a consequence of the 64 report or whether it had nothing to do with it, it has changed a great deal in terms of its role in today's world. But I'd like to go back and paint a little picture before, uh, before we start with the committee itself, because at the dawn of the 20th, uh, 21st century, we see the United States in quite a different perspective. It now stands alone as the world's greatest superpower, and you and I are used to seeing it unveil new scientific technologic advances in medicine each day for prevention, for cure, and for elimination of disease. But in stark contrast to that, when we look at the subject that we're talking about today, this country is still mired in quicksand of a medical disaster it largely created for itself. This, that tobacco-induced in, medical disaster, although it is somewhat lessened in this country at the present time,
continues to rage unabated worldwide, which should be of major concern to everyone here. During the 19th century, chewing of tobacco began in the United States and became the dominant tobacco use in the 20th century, along with pipe smoking. Cigarettes were largely unknown in the United States until the 1860s when rolling one's own cigarette became a fad in the Southwest. Cigarette popularity began to increase after 1910 and reached its height in the 1950s. At the beginning of the 20th century, about 1910, Americans developed mass manufacturing and mass distribution of cigarettes and the tragic epidemic of cigarette caused cancer, heart disease, and emphysema was launched. The epidemic spread rapidly and it was aided by the free distribution of cigarettes in World War I, World War II, and the Korean conflict and was aided, of course, by the addicting quality of nicotine. But by the middle of the 20th century, this disastrous increase in tobacco-caused disease forced numerous reevaluations of the problem by a number of different professional and voluntary agencies, including the Royal College of Physicians of London and several by the United States Public Health Service itself. The Pressure really did not begin to develop, however, in this country until the early 1960s uh, when the United States government suddenly found that it needed clarification of its position on the controversy. And it reached its peak primarily because of the 1962 Royal College of Physicians of London report. The impact of this report, although not great in Great Britain, could not be contained to Great Britain and it was to have a lasting effect upon the course of events in the United States. Let's now focus on the actual events that led to the creation of the Advisory Committee to the Surgeon General on Smoking and Health. Without question, the Advisory Committee was born amidst controversy. In the United States, the tobacco companies repeatedly brushed aside all scientific evidence as, quote, mere statistical association that provided no evidence of causation, close quote. This cavalier response was to be their sole mantra in defense. Their propaganda wasn't very effective, so much so that many others in this country did not wish to have a new study. You might wonder why, but we need to look at the setting then, and we see that in 1962, most American men use tobacco in some form, approximately 78%. Second, there was no clarion call for a study as only about one third of, the, of Americans were at all concerned about, uh, <coughs> excuse me, about smoking causing lung cancer, and about 60% were not. The Food and Drug Administration determined that cigarettes did not qualify as hazardous under their new Hazardous Substances Act. But most of all, an adversarial Congress, addicted to cigarette tax revenue and heavily influenced by the personal financial largesse of the tobacco lobby and a less than enthusiastic executive branch, were not anxious to confront the issue. The White House, early in the Kennedy administration, with high priority items like the Cuban Missile Crisis, the civil rights issues, and tax cuts, did not want to lose the support of Southern congressmen for, uh, by embracing the tobacco controversy. However, the outcry for clarification of the role of tobacco and causation of chronic diseases would not be totally silent. The presidents of the American Cancer Society, American Heart Association, National Tuberculosis Association, and the American Public Health Association wrote to President John F. Kennedy on June 1, 1961, requesting that he appoint a presidential commission to evaluate the health consequences of tobacco. On June 6, the White House sent a memorandum to the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, Abraham Ribicoff, asking for the department's advice and guidance in preparing the reply. The Undersecretary replied on June 27, attaching a draft of a letter 
for the president, stating, quote, a new commission would be inconsistent with the president's policy to abolish a number of independent commissions and advisory committees, close quote. The president approved the draft, sent the draft forward on June 29th to the presidents of the voluntary health associations. The rejection by this bureaucratic double talk did not dismay Dr. Harold S. Deal from Minnesota, the recently elected president of the American Cancer Society. Dr. Deal wrote on September 5, 1961, to the new Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, Anthony Celebrisi, former mayor of Cincinnati, requesting a meeting for the four voluntary health agencies. Apparently, Secretary Celebrisi was afflicted with the same disease that struck Abraham Lincoln's generals, a disease that Lincoln himself diagnosed as, quote, the slows. Four months later, in January of 1962, the secretary shuffled a letter to the Surgeon General, quote, for appropriate action. Clearly up to this point, no one in the executive branch was at all interested in embracing this hot potato. The recently appointed Surgeon General Luther Leonidas Terry, however, was ready for the challenge. Surgeon General Terry met with the Voluntary Health Agencies on January the 4th, 1962, and on February the 1st proposed to Secretary Celebrezzi creation of a national commission to assess the available evidence on smoking and health. No immediate response occurred. Two months later, April 16th, Surgeon General Terry, pushed by Senator Maureen Newberger's solo, relentless, anti-tobacco campaign, sent a redrafted, more detailed proposal calling for re-evaluation of the U.S. Public Health Service's position on the question. Dr. Terry's two proposals, dated February the 1st and April 16th, continued to languish on the Secretary Celebrezzi's uh, desk until the last week of May. It's a matter for speculation as to whether the Surgeon General uh, Terry's proposals would have ever been acted upon without an un unanticipated event at President Kennedy's May 23, 1962 press conference. Toward the end of a lengthy press conference, an investigative reporter for the Washington Evening Star, L. Edgar Prenna, asked, quote, Mr. President, there's another health problem that seems to be causing growing concern here and abroad. And I think it has largely been <coughs> provoked by a series of independent scientific investigations, which have concluded that cigarette smoking and certain types of cancer and heart disease have a causal connection. I have two questions. Do you and your health advisors agree or disagree with these findings? And second, what, if anything, should or can the federal government do in the circumstances? The president responded, and I quote, the matter is sensitive enough and the stock market is in sufficient difficulty, and then there was laughter, without my giving you an answer which is not based on complete information, which I don't have, and therefore perhaps we could, I would be glad to respond to this question in more detail next week. Eleven months had transpired since the four voluntary agencies initiated action. Now a restatement of Surgeon General Terry's April 16, 1962 proposal was being sent to the White House at the White House's request as a consequence of the May 23, 1962 press conference. The White House, under pressure from the press, approved Surgeon General Terry's proposal. President Kennedy assured Surgeon General Terry there would be no political interference and instructed him to form a committee and undertake the task. On June 19th, Surgeon General Terry issued the <coughs> following statement. It is timely to undertake a comprehensive review of all of the data. I have decided to appoint an expert advisory committee to study the evidence on smoking and health, evaluate it, and make whatever recommendation may be appropriate. The selection of a panel of experts will be made after consultation with the federal agencies involved, non-governmental professional groups, health organizations, and 
the tobacco industry. The inclusion of the tobacco industry was ridiculed by charges of bias, whitewash, rubber stamp. In retrospect, however, it appears to have been a wise, disarming strategy. On this slide, you will see the groups chosen for nomination of the members. Note the Tobacco Institute is present at all of the meetings. A second meeting on July the 27th, 1962, compiled a list of names of more than 150 scientists and physicians. During the next month, the nominee list were screened by the same representatives, including the Tobacco Institute. They were given instructions to eliminate for whatever reason and return the approved list by August the 3rd. The group meeting on July the 24th had also agreed that individuals who had already taken a strong public position pro or con on the controversy were not to be chosen and none were. None of the representatives of any organization or group could be named. Only five names were removed, none by the tobacco industry. The honed list of 150 names was available in late August 1962 and approved by Surgeon General Terry. Dr. Peter Hamill was assigned the task of recommending to the Surgeon General the fin uh, final list of those who would be invited to serve. Dr. Hamill later submitted only 10 names to the Surgeon General who approved all of them and forwarded them to the White House for final approval. In addition, the nominating group approved a far more comprehensive and more thorough study than had ever been attempted before. According to Dr. Terry, the study would be concerned not only with tobacco, but also with all other factors that might be involved in causing cancer, such as air pollution, automobile exhaust, occupational hazards, and radiation. The study was expected to get underway by mid-September 1962 with a first phase hopefully completed in approximately six months. This estimated completion in six months by Dr. Terry raised expectations of Congress and of the public. The six-month expectation was not presented to the advisory committee as a completion date. Indeed, the committee would be assured several times by Dr. Terry there would be no time limit. On August 24, 1962, another press release was issued. Surgeon General Terry announced two staff appointments to his advisory committee on smoking and health. Dr. Terry announced that Herman F. Craybill, Ph.D., would be the executive director of the study. Dr. Peter Hamill would be the medical coordinator. At this point, no contact had been made with the nominees who were unaware that they had been nominated. Dr. Terry authorized Dr. Hamill to make exploratory contact with each of the chosen candidates and confirm his, Dr. Hamill's, judgment on the merits of each nominee. Dr. Terry had full confidence in Dr. Hamill's judgment. If he felt so inclined, Dr. Hamill was authorized to offer a verbal commitment of a position to the advisory committee. Not surprise, unsurprising, this recruitment did not go smoothly. Although the nominees had been aware of their, had not been aware they were being considered, they were acutely aware of the controversial nature of the topic to be studied. First, they knew that the recent studies in the United States and Great Britain had failed to produce conclusions sufficient to settle the controversy. Second, some had had bad experiences with government studies. Third, the scientific evidence available was far from perfect and gaps in information could be anticipated. Much of the evidence scattered in different disciplines had never been correlated, so the work would not be easily easy. Fourth, the judgments would, that would be necessary on the strengths of the causal association from diverse categorical areas, including evidence from experimental, epidemiological, clinical, and pathological data would be difficult. Fifth, the invitation to serve while maintaining their full-time academic appointments was considered unrealistic as all were carrying full academic loads. Sixth, the, perhaps the most difficult hurdle would be to establish 
creditable new criteria for causal significance of the associations found among the several categories of evidence. All of the nominees realized that without creation of new operational standards for causation, conclusions by a new committee would not likely stop the controversy. Many excellent studies in the United States and Great Britain had produced clear, concise answers to the relevant role of tobacco in the causation of human disease, but the controversy had continued. So there was little reason to expect that the results from yet another study using past criteria for causation would be persuasive. The nominees selected for the committee from the date of invitation to join for weeks before the first meeting had frequent in-depth meetings with Dr. Hamill at their academic home base. Convinced he had the right 10 men, he vigorously pursued their acceptance. The 10 selected are pictured with Dr. Guthrie standing by me on the far right of the second row. And I think you can see Dr. Guthrie here. He becomes very important in this study as he took over and saw to the publication of the study as Dr. Hamill had to go on medical leave toward the end of the study and at the time of this picture was on medical leave. Dr. Hamill's strategy with the 10 members, however, worked surprisingly well. He obtained agreement upon the general area of study, albeit after considerable give and take. Each member agreed to accept responsibility for evaluation of at least one major area, most working in two or more areas simultaneously. All members agreed to become familiar with the total massive evidence in the past, from the past, and to accept primary responsibility for preparing an in-depth report to be reviewed and approved by the entire advisory committee. All of Dr. Hamill's negotiations were completed with the chosen 10 before he recommended the names to Dr. Terry. Six of the 10 were users of tobacco in some form. Four of the six smoked cigarettes. Not entirely an unbiased group. <laughs> Surgeon General Terry on October the 28th announced the appointment of 10 members to his advisory committee on smoking and health. Dr. Terry would be chairman of the committee. These are the committee members, and I'll just ask you to read what's below each of the pictures, for it's a synopsis of their career. <laughs> These were outstanding scientists who had accomplished much in different fields. Uh, Dr. Severs was an authority on addiction. Dr. Schumann, of course, was an epidemiologist. And this one you recognize. <laughs> And the next, Dr. Firth, was professor of pathology, a non-smoker, happened to have been my teacher of pathology at Cornell and at Columbia. Dr. Walter Burdett was noted not only in surgery, but also in genetics, uh, his hobby. Dr. Hickey, Dr. Hickam rather, excuse me, was a internist of great renown, particularly uh, schooled in cardiovascular disease and in pulmonary disease. And Bill Cochran was a fantastic statistician and really the backbone and genius of much of the analysis of this committee. Dr. Sandholm Bain Jones had a CV that would take the rest of the hour to present, but he was a former dean of Yale Medical School, had been associated with Cornell Medical School for many years, and was a Brigadier General. Dr. James Hunley was the vice chairman and stood in for Dr. Terry to chair the meetings, but did not get involved deeply in the findings or the study, except at the meetings. And he was a career public health service commissioned officer. Dr. Eugene Guthrie came to fill the role for Dr. Hamill when Dr. Hamill became ill, had been head of the largest division of uh, the public health service, Division of Chronic Diseases, and truly was a masterful administrator. Dr. Mr. Don Shopland, the young man pictured here, came on working pretty much as a gopher for the committee, but then developed into the one who ran the clearinghouse on smoking for the rest of his very prominent career in the public health service. And Dr. Peter V. V. Hamill, pictured here, who passed away in March of this year, uh, and is a source of much of the information 
that I'm presenting to you today concluded the group. Dr. Hamill was the driving force and the glue that held this advisory committee together through many of its trials and tribulations. The press release announcing this also contained a reference to Dr. Herman Craybill, who had been named the committee's executive director. Dr. Craybill was forced to step down when he told a reporter back home he believed the evidence, quote, definitely suggests that tobacco is a health hazard, close quote. The position of a direct executive director was never filled except by Dr. Peter Hamill, who did two jobs as medical coordinator and executive director. It should also be noted that Surgeon General Terry again stated for the second time his expe expectation that the review would be completed by the summer of 1963. Unfortunately, by this time, his expectation was seized upon as a promise by many, and this became a statement that would haunt Dr. Terry in May 1963 and perhaps was responsible for the pressure on the Public Health Service for an early completion. It's worthy of note that Dr. Hamill in his oral history for the Kennedy Library stated that there were difficulties in getting the 10 members of the committee to accept the offer. He said, quote, None of them were looking for a job like this. They were all overcommitted as it was. They had all served on lots of committees in the past. Quite a number of them had initially turned it down. I was able to sell them when I told them the point was that the Surgeon General had offered almost unconditional support. I was able to get across the Surgeon General's absolute promise that this was really something different. Serving the committee was a difficult role for Dr. Terry at times. For Here's an example. He sensed the uncertainty of this committee about it, the commitments that were being made. But after they accepted, Dr. Terry backed up his commitments to Dr. Hamill and to the committee at the first meeting extensively, at the second meeting in November 1960, uh, the first meeting in November 1962, and at the second meeting in January 1963, and again in the third meeting, March 1963, he repeatedly said in one form or another, quote, no one, absolutely no one will dictate to this committee, certainly not as for how to proceed with the study, how long it takes, or any of its conclusion. It determines its own mode of operation. Unfortunately for Dr. Terry, his boss, Secretary Celebrezzi, had foot and mouth disease and announced at the press club, of all places, his opposition to the government telling its citizens not to smoke. Secretary Celebrezzi stated he did not consider it, quote, the proper role of the federal government to tell its citizens to stop smoking. His remarks made front page news. In an attempt to reassure the his wavering committee, Dr. Terry sent a lengthy letter from Secretary Celebrezzi explaining his statement and concluding with, and I quote, should the Surgeon General find that smoking is injurious to health, this information would be rapidly communicated to all segments of the population, close quote. The advisory committee was not impressed with Secretary Celebrezzi's letter because it did not endorse the study and there is no record that Sec Secretary Celebrezzi had ever approved the study. The first three meetings of the advisory committee in November of 1962, January of 1963, and March of 1963 were very productive. A partial review of the massive literature, over 7,000 of the reports of the 11,000 reports total, had been largely completed and over one half of the consultants' reports had been submitted, although not yet in final form. The subcommittees of the advisory committee, through which most of the work was done, had submitted at least a preliminary report. The upcoming fourth meeting on May 3rd and 4th was anticipated to be a critical focus for the process of carcinogenesis and the final unraveling of the process by which cancer of the lung occurred. The first day of the meeting was disappointing, as the evidence presented on car carcinogenicity and bioassay, including all of the evidence from the tobacco industry sources, 
had little pertinence to carcinogenicity in man. There were nine volumes of evidence presented by the tobacco company, none of which were considered relevant to the question. Opening the second day, May 4th, 1963, Dr. Hundley spoke to the need to expedite the work of the committee in order to have the report finished promptly. No reason was given for change in timing. One of the two options presented by Dr. Hundley was to have the PHS staff prepare the report for the committee's <coughs> approval. Another was the committee could stop its inquiry, prepare the report, and sign it now. The time limit time limit was disturbing enough, but the two options were absolutely unacceptable. Dr. Terry had assured the committee in the presence of Dr. Hundley there was no time limit and that he would not allow one to be set other than by the committee. To say the least, the new message by Dr. Hundley, that Dr. Hundley delivered without reference to Dr. Terry's previous assurances got the committee's undivided attention. Dr. Hundley's commitments were interpreted by the committee to say, quote, gentlemen, if you can't do the job, we'll do the job now, we the Public Health Service. The committee was stunned by Dr. Hundley's comments and demanded an, an immediate executive session without Dr. Hundley, Dr. Hamill, or the staff present to discuss the dramatic change. They, they, they were all instructed to stand by on call while the apparent bait and switch message was discussed. As you might expect from a group of academics, the immediate response was temporal and analytical. The advisory committee began to analyze the, session, the situation unemotionally, asking such questions as, could it be that outside pressure from Congress and or the White House, stimulated by the tobacco interest, was attempting to destroy the report? Could it be just a stupid administrative gesture to prod the committee to work faster? Was Dr. Hundley authorized by Dr. Terry to deliver the time change? No matter what the source or the motivation, the advisory committee became more enraged. After approximately an hour and a half, they asked Dr. Hundley to return alone for questioning. His answers to the questions did not disclose reasons or the source for the abrupt change. And despite the extensive direct questions with no answers, he maintained his announced position. In effect, the word of the Surgeon General was countermanded. The advisory committee, realizing that it must address Dr. Hundley's timetable, asked Dr. Hundley to leave and return to its executive session. After about 45 minutes, the committee asked Dr. Hundley and Dr. Hamill to return. The committee was firm in its response. Dr. Hundley was told that the unanimous position of the advisory committee was that the public health service would not be allowed to use their names in a report they did not write and approve not only every conclusion but every word. There would be no minority report. The advisory committee was willing to continue only under the assurance, assurances originally given by Surgeon General Terry to do the report on a timetable that the committee set with no outside interference. If this was not acceptable, the advisory committee would submit their resignations and let the chips fall where they may. The Public Health Service could then explain its decision to the public and the press. In effect, the advisory committee placed the decision in the hands of the Public Health Service. It, if the advisory committee was to continue, the advisory committee would be in control of the content and the timing of the report. The advisory committee forced the Public Health Service to choose the only course open to them. The committee would continue under the mandates and assurances given to them by Surgeon General Terry. The stance taken by the advisory committee during the executive session reflected the iron will of the advisory committee to conduct and control its own study from this date forward. Three decades later, Dr. Hamill speculated in an oral history for the John F. Kennedy Library as to where the pressure came to cause Dr. Hundley's statement. 
His candidates were the politically powerful tobacco companies mediating their influence through the White House or the Senate or the Democratic National Committee, hoping to get the anticipated nationwide impact of the report out of the way before the next general election. Combining the experiences of the advisor committee and the views of Dr. Hamill, it's reasonable to assume a political urgency prompted the pressure to speed up the study. The pressure was brought upon the Surgeon General who had stated repeatedly in public that the first phase might be completed by midsummer of 1963. It's my personal view that Assistant Surgeon, Assistant Surgeon General Hundley realizing his boss was caught between public statements and his commitments to the advisory committee, may have intervened in an attempt to get the committee to commit to an early date for a release of the report. But even with the best of intentions, Dr. Hunley, an outstanding military-style administrator, misjudged the independence of the academic minds that he was addressing. The committee had indeed accomplished much of the review by, by the May meeting, but had not yet addressed the criteria for causation, the histopathological sequence caused by smoking that led to lung cancer in man, the key seven prospective studies on relation in man of smoking and lung cancer, all vital to the credibility of the report. The advisory committee could not under any circumstances agree to stop and publish an unfinished study. Whatever the source or whatever the purpose of Dr. Hanley's new timetable, its goals failed and the advisory committee was bonded in fierce independence and integrity, whether their conclusions be right or wrong. By August 2006, Dr. Hamill's views had mellowed about the May 1963 meeting. He, however, did describe it as, and I quote Dr. Hamill, Betrayal at the May meeting. Betrayal is the only appropriate word. I was betrayed, but I felt the entire burden that you guys, the committee, were betrayed. From promises, the, co the covenant given to you by the Surgeon General in exchange for accepting the responsibility for the study. Close quote. It's understandable that Dr. Hamill felt betrayed because he delivered the absolute commitment of the Surgeon General that led the members to join the advisory committee. Nonetheless, the approach by the Public Health Service was poorly handled and destroyed the trust between the committee and the Public Health Service that had been so carefully nurtured over the first eight months. No longer would a partnership be tolerated, for the committee now realized further attempts at compromise might result sooner or later. From this low point in May, the advisory committee had one of its most important cornerstones in place within a month. As stated earlier, it was patently clear the advisory committee would have to find a new approach to the evaluation of existing scientific evidence if its conclusions were to be creditable. The creation of new criteria for scientific proof of causation was absolutely necessary for underpinning the conclusions. There was no alternative. Creditable criteria for scientific proof of causation must be created anew or the report would fail. Dr. Hamill addressed this concern, <coughs> this concern in June of 1963 by assemb assembling Dr. Leonard Schumann, Professor William G. Cochran, Dr. Johannes Ibsen, and Dr. Ruel Arthur Stallones, who was to later to become our Dean of the School of Public Health here, for a three-day epidemiologic brainstorming retreat in Saratoga Springs, New York which focused on the criteria necessary for the proof of causation in multifactorial chronic diseases. On the third day, after two productive days of debate, at the last dinner meeting, Dr. Hamill relates, quote, Stoney Stallones took out his pack of lucky strikes, <laughs> pushed the cigarettes aside, and with his left hand scratched down four criteria on the inner wrapper of the cigarette package and said, isn't this what we've been talking about? Stoney handed the paper to me, to Dr. Uh, Hamill. I read it to the group. All knew we had succeeded upon hearing the simple, brilliant language. 
Stallone summarized the criteria and succeeded far better than I had anticipated. Dr. Stallone wrote that causation should depend upon, and you see them displayed here. The others present quickly agreed, and the discussion led to adding one more, the temporal relationship of the association. Dr. Stallone's succinct, clear criteria ended the long debate, and this is how he explained the reasons for his thinking. He focused the attention of all present upon testing each of the criteria for operational validity for smoking, cigarette smoking, and lung cancer. This slide and the next show Dr. Stallone's presentation at the Saratoga meeting, testing the six criteria for cigarette causation of lung cancer. The new criteria submitted to the advisory committee were reviewed, debated at some length, and unanimously adopted. The basic criteria used in the 1964 report were adopted subsequently for widespread use in epidemiological studies as the criteria for determining causation. Perhaps the greatest praise came from, for the criteria from a Philip Morris insider. He found the report well-organized and substantive and was particularly struck, quote, by how the committee devised those criteria for attribution of causation to a statistical association. It was very clear. It lent force and authority to what might have been a readily attackable conclusion. They made it very hard to challenge. Three decades later, Dr. Hamill stated, and I quote, it revolutionized the field of epidemiology at the time. It was paradigmatic change Sir Austin Bradford Hill borrowed our criteria and smoothed them over one year later in 1965 for a major address in England. Since our two reports, almost every textbook on epidemiology contains some version of the criteria with explanations and examples. The advisory committee stood firm on its decision that there would be no minority report issued. This, of course, of course, led to lengthy debates on a number of issues because the committee had decided they must be unanimous in every segment of the report and on every word. As shown in the next slide, there were, the debates were often contentious discussions. These are a selected few of the contentious discussions. The constitutional theory of causation of lung cancer led to sharply divided views. Dr. Walter Burdett, a surgeon and a geneticist, thought that genetic factors might be among the major causes of cancer. After being unimpressed with the data from Berkson and Fisher, and very impressed with the extensive data coming and through and confirming cigarettes as the major cause, Dr. Len Schumann and all other committee members insisted the constitutional theory should not be given serious consideration as the major cause. The final version de-emphasized the role of constitutional factors without eliminating them. The question as to whether nicotine should be considered addictive was the subject of another, another bitter disagreement. Nine committee members considered nicotine addictive, but Dr. Maurice Severs, an authority on addiction, insisted that it must be characterized as habituation in conformity with the then accepted WHO definitions. In rebuttal, Dr. Hickam and Dr. Lemaitre argued that the WHO criteria made little sense as many known addicting agents would not fit the WHO criteria. Right or wrong, the criteria were followed and nicotine was labeled in the report as habituating until Dr. Severs and others from the committee could get the criteria changed six months later. The advisory committee did not unanimously accept reports from even eminent consultants. The histopathological sequence of changes in the bronchi as lung cancer developed, submitted by Dr. Oscar Auerbach, looked too good to be true. Dr. Farber, Dr. Hamill, and Professor Cochran spent three days in Dr. Auerbach's laboratory before, before asserting that this cornerstone work could be relied upon. In a similar fashion, Dr. E. Kyler Hammond's outstanding prospective studies 
on cigarette smoking as the major cause of lung cancer was well received by everyone, but concerns were expressed about the design of the population studies. A few months later, Dr. Hamill, Dr. Hammond submitted the same unequivocal conclusions, but with additional evidence, but without the design flaws. These conclusions became another pillar of evidence implicating smoking as the major cause of lung cancer. The evidence for six of the seven conclusions about smoking and chronic bronchitis and emphysema were readily accepted by the advisory committee. Two members of the subcommittees, Drs. Farber and Lemaitre, disagreed. However, on the criteria for causation that were being fully met by the limited epidemiologic evidence on the association of smoking and emphysema, there was no disagreement between the two members that cigarettes were the major cause of emphysema. The disagreement was whether the limited studies at that time met the criteria of the advisory committee for causation. Dr. Farber thought they did, Dr. Lemaitre thought they did not. It was a decade later before epidemiological evidence met the criteria and unequivocally proved that cigarette smoking is the major cause of emphysema. These are a few, about a few of the contentious disagreements, all of which were resolved to enable the committee to agree upon a report without a minority report. Two highly productive meetings of the Subcommittee on Lung Cancer and Carcinogenesis in May 1963 in Toronto, Canada should be cited. For the first time, consensus was reached on all on criteria for the pathological diagnosis of adenocarcinoma, for squamous cell carcinoma, and for a mixed type, and as to the gradation in mitotic activity, all topics lacking clarity in the literature. Much confusion still centered about the early stages of carcinogenesis and the meaning of the terms metaplasia, precancerous, carcinoma in situ, and so forth. The second meeting in May focused on tobacco and lung cancer and the histopathological sequence of carcinogenesis. Chaired by Dr. Walter Burdett and doctors, with Drs. Farber, Firth, and Hamill present, the two-day meeting was attended by nine carefully selected experts on carcinogenesis, including Dr. Oscar Auerbach. The report from this subcommittee meeting to the advisory committee was extremely valuable, undergirding the indictment of cigarettes as the major cause of lung cancer. The progression of histopathological changes produced in man by cigarette smoking had been validated. The conclusions from this meeting en enable such statements as, when the evidence from the clinical, epidemiological, histological, and pathological disciplines was finally correlated, the advisory committee was unanimous in its conclusion that cigarette smoking is causally related to lung cancer in men. The magnitude of the effect of cigarette smoking far outweighs all other factors. From a historical standpoint, the second Toronto meeting produced the strongest histopathological evidence linking cigarette smoking to lung cancer in man. The following month, another subcommittee of the advisory committee achieved yet another milestone. One last major hurdle remained. Professor William Cochran and Dr. Leonard Schumann had been working diligently on the seven prospective epidemiologic studies related to cigarette smoking and occurrence of disease. At the July 1963 Advisory Committee meeting, they made their final report. The combined reports from these seven massive studies demonstrated a high mortality ratio for cigarette smokers and cancer of the lung and bronchi, cancer of the larynx and oral cancer, and cancer of the esophagus and for emphysema. In all seven studies, coronary artery disease was the chief contributor to the excess deaths among smokers. The advisory committee unanimously endorsed the thorough analysis of the prospective studies. The final cornerstone of evidence had been laid with unequivocal evidence now in place from clinical, pathological, experimental, and epidemiological data. The work of the advisory committee had culminated in a fundamental understanding of the relation of smoking to health. 
General agreement had been reached on the major issues, cancer, chronic bronchitis, and emphysema, and cardio cardiovascular disease. The remaining meetings of the Advisory Committee in October and November 1963 were devoted to final agreement on every word in the draft. The November 1963 meeting had been scheduled for the committee to approve the text before the final meeting. The dates chosen were the last weeks in November, the latest deadline allowed uh, for printing by the end of the year. I was at Parkland Hospital on that fateful day when President Kennedy, who had authorized our study, was assassinated. Mrs. Kennedy was asked whether she wished us to proceed or delay, and she said we should proceed with our scheduled meetings in November, as the President was very interested in having the study released as soon as possible. The November meeting was held in Bethesda, and the final wording approved adjourning only during the funeral procession down Pennsylvania Avenue. Dr. Guthrie delivered the manuscript to the U.S. Government Printing Office as a top secret document. Dr. Guthrie was told this was the first civilian document ever printed under top secret security. The report was released for Jan was scheduled for release on January the 11th, 1964 at the State Department on a Saturday when the stock market would be closed. The report was delivered in an armored truck at 7 a.m. to the State Department Auditorium. A single copy for President Johnson was delivered to the White House at the same hour. Each committee member was assigned a numbered seat on the stage as was Surgeon General Terry and his staff. Ironically, the West Auditorium of the State Department is the same location which President Kennedy's May 23, 1962 press conference was held. At 8.30 in the morning in a separate locked room, the press and the media received a numbered copy of the report and were given 90 minutes for review. They had been instructed they would not have telephone access or be allowed to leave until the press conference concluded. That may be one of the more amazing things that happened. <laughs> Surgeon General Terry commented on the preparation of the report. I want to express our gratitude to the distinguished members of the committee for unstinted devotion with which they applied their scientific skills to the preparation of this report. This has provided us with the most comprehensive compilation and analysis ever undertaken on the relationship of smoking and health. At the time I requested this group of 10 eminent scientists to undertake this evaluation, neither they nor I fully appreciated the immensity of the task on which they would be embarked, nor did any of us realize the demands on time and effort that would be exacted by the evaluation. To them, to the many consultants who assisted, to the committee staff, we are measurably dedicated. Dr. Terry, after introductions of the committee and staff, summarized the major reports of uh, conclusions. Quote, out of its long and exhaustive deliberations, the committee has reached the overall judgment that cigarette smoking is a health hazard of sufficient importance to the United States to warrant remedial action. There was some stirring and some murmuring in the audience, possibly because of the breadth of the indictment. Dr. Terry concluded, this overall judgment was supported by many converging lines of evidence as well as by data indicating that cigarette smoking is related to higher death rates in a number of disease categories. In, viewing, in view of the continuing and mounting evidence from many sources, it is the judgment of the committee that cigarette smoking contributes substantially to the mortality from certain specific diseases and to the overall mortality death rate. Sensing the audience was anxious to raise questions, Dr. Terry called for questions. The first question asked if the, was if the report, quote, cons constitutes the official thinking of the Public Health Service belief as regards to smoking and health. Dr. Terry replied, quote, no, this is the report of the committee to the Public Health Service, close quote. He judged the report an excellent report, but until his staff could review it and he had had the opportunity to affirm it, it would not be the official position. 
Indeed, only the advisory committee, Dr. Guthrie, and the staff required to format the copy for printing had seen the report prior to release in order to maintain security of these findings. Numerous questions were asked of the advisory committee members and about the report's findings. The press conference ended after about an hour. Doors were unlocked and the news reporters ran for the telephones to break their stories. The feature writers and the TV anchors sought out committee members for more background and sound bites. The Saturday evening news and the Sunday papers featured the conclusions of the report on front pages, with high acclaim as did major magazines and periodicals for months. Three decades later, Dr. Stan Glantz published the book Cigarette Papers, disclosing the internal papers of the tobacco companies. This disclosure proved conclusively that the tobacco companies knew in the 1960s while the advisory committee was meeting of the deadly effects and the addiction caused by tobacco. One vice president considered that they were in the business of selling an addicting instrument, the cigarette. In the foreword to this book, C. Everett Koop, Surgeon General 1981 through 1989 wrote, and I quote, one can speculate with enormous regret how different that 1964 Surgeon General's report would have been had the tobacco companies shared their research with the Surgeon General's advisory committee. What would have been the history in the United States and the world if that report had had the benefit of all of the information available on tobacco and held privy to the inner circles of the cigarette manufacturing company? The contrast of public and private statements from the tobacco industry reveals their deceit. In the intervening 43 years since that historic report, the original findings have been strengthened and by an incredible amount of data against tobacco products, particularly cigarettes and documented in almost 30 reports of the Surgeon General. Cumulative knowledge from over 50,000 studies have documented the unprecedented lung cancer epidemic produced by cigarette smoking. In fact, few biologic relationships have ever been worked out with such thoroughness as the lethal role that cigarettes and cigarette smoke play in serious chronic disease. The knowledge gained in those four decades has been translated into, quote, a downward trend in tobacco use since 19, the 1964 report that has been described by the Institutes of Medicine as one of the 10 greatest achievements in public health in the 20th century. Historians in years to come will surely shake their heads in disbelief over the persistent prevalence of smoking in the supposedly civilized world of the 20th and 21st century. Looking forward, we stand with an unparalleled opportunity to rid our country and ultimately all nations of the disastrous health consequences of smoking. The question is whether we have the will. Fortunately for the 1964 report to the Surgeon General, it was created despite the controversy. It did survive the pressures generated by the tobacco companies. Perhaps the most significant impact was that it provided the impetus for research and for 28 subsequent Surgeon General's reports on the subject. The New York Public Library has another way of measuring impact on society their selection of the books of the century. The 1964 Advisory Committee report to the Surgeon General on Smoking Health was selected as one of the 10 books with an immediate and lasting impact on the 20th century. It was listed in the category of Nature's Realm, along with Einstein's The Meaning of Relativity and Marie Curie's Treatise on Radioact Radioactivity. I conclude with the citation from the uh, the, for the 1964 report, which reads as you can read there as to what happened. And I'll give you a moment to look at that because it concludes with the sentence, the tobacco industry and its most powerful lobbies continue to discount the findings of smoking and health. The presentation today is from a work in progress for the archives of M.D. Anderson, encouraged by Dr. John Mendelson and Dr. Bernard Levine, 
and the faculty in cancer prevention. Those shown on this slide here have contributed to this effort, and much of the material was obtained from their personal recollections as well as from the oral history project of the John F. Kennedy Library and from the United States National Archives and Records Administration, where all of the papers of the Surgeon General Smoking and Health Committee are placed. This last slide is on just merely to show you a recapitulation of what is uh, of some interest. Going back all the way to the turn of the century, you see that cigarette smoking, tobacco use by that means, was not very prominent early until World Wars I and II gave it, <coughs> gave it boost that kicked it up very high. And you see what the predominant use of cigarette of tobacco was prior to that time, which declined immeasurably after this. But look at what happened here in, 19, in the 1960s when this report was issued approximately right here. There was already concern present, but this steady decline brings it down now to a level which it has plateaued, unfortunately, and now will require a new approach to eradicate smoking completely from our presence. I think uh, that we have experienced something in this epidemic uh, that is quite unusual and still rages around the world, but fortunately is on the decline in this country, or at least was on the decline in this country, until the plateau was reached at about the 20% level, which is roughly the same level as which young people are still taking up the habit. Thank you very much for your attention. Do you have questions?